Great. All right. Well, pleasure to be here. Thank you. And uh, hopefully at some point we can start doing these uh, all in person. It'll be a lot more fun. So we got a lot to go over. I want to really thank uh, Dr. Jim and Dr. Posh for uh, all the organization and, and putting up with me. And um, they've done a great job. And, you know, it's actually hard to find pictures of these two without next to somebody else because they're usually just uh, honoring other people and they do so much themselves. So they do a really great job. So my hat's off. And a lot of you know that I'm a fan of Mountain Dew, so. We'll get started here. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about hydrodissections of peripheral nerves and some just elements of what we can do with peripheral nerves with guided injections. And the thing about that is there's currently not a great deal of literature support. So a lot of what we're doing with these are anecdotal, um, but, but they're starting to increase and starting to improve. As you know, it's ultrasound guided. The idea is introducing large volumes of fluid around peripheral nerves to alleviate entrapment. And this can be from fibrosis or other types of entrapments. And I'll give a few examples of that. And there's different mixes of things that can be used for this. It can be D5. And, and a lot of people like to do that. Normal saline, steroid, local anesthetic, or any combination of those. So we use live visualization so we can actually see these images better than the surgical field because we can see deep to the nerves. We can see the structures around them and go well, well beyond the surgical field. So it has a lot of advantages there. And we don't leave post-surgical scars. So there's not a lot of downside to that. It can be performed safely and there's a lot of positive case reports. And uh, we need more studies though on efficacy and exactly what things we should be doing in different circumstances. Okay. And the idea of hydrodissection, um, there's an example of getting off an impaired nerve. This one's swollen. This has an enlarged fascicle inside. And these are nerves that can be treated. And the idea is to create a halo and open up your fluid and injectate around the nerve. And I'll start it with a little case report. So this is a 42 year old woman that was sent for ultrasound and was given a diagnosis of complex regional pain syndrome and was really having a very difficult time, was found to actually have um, a superficial fibular neuropathy that was incomplete. And this was confirmed with a very low amplitude sensory nerve action potential on um, electrophysiology. And what we found was just a, an intact nerve, but a focal neuroma within the nerve from the contusion. And this was causing just tremendous amount of pain. And you can see that when you're long axis to a nerve, you can very easily miss the neuroma. And, and that's why we generally want to start looking in, in short axis view. But by moving back and forth with our transducer, you can see the neuroma just pop out of um, that context there. And so just to show an example of the way to approach this is to, we can use an oblique standoff so we can see the approach of the needle. And I like to get a little bit of injectate to add conspicuity to this little tiny nerve. And by doing that, we can know we're not doing an inner neural injection and we can start trying to move some of the scar tissue or fibrous tissue if it's a post-surgical case. So you'll see a couple of these in slow-mo here. So we start with a little injectate to make it more conspicuous. And then we move on both sides of it open up space and we can peel it off of um, areas if it's scarred. And this is a live version of that same. And these are really short videos. I should combine them somehow. But there you'll notice that we actually start past the nerve a little bit underneath it. We can find the border with greater conspicuity when we do that. And then keep on moving and get above on both sides of it. So some general concepts, we can use this for post-operative pain, but also in non-surgical patients. It's usually around surgical scar when, when I do them most of the time. And you can use anesthetic, normal saline, or dextrose. And what I'll say is generally, I try to minimize the anesthetic that I use for these um, because most of the anesthetics are neurotoxic and we're trying to create an environment where they do better without that. So we try to minimize that. Sometimes we'll need more than one session, but it's really variable. And the, and the nature of the patient presenting 
to me is how I'm going to decide to do it. So this is as much of an art form as a science sometimes. Sometimes they're so in so much pain that if you don't get very good pain relief from the first injection, they're probably not going to come back. So we may use more anesthetic on the first one and make the first one more about pain relief or maybe even a diagnostic anesthetic block to see if it's, it's helpful and um, give them a sense that this could, um, making this area better would help them. Sometimes it's difficult to get through scar tissue. We want to make sure that we're always identifying the blood vessels and avoid those with pre-scanning. And we want to scan in both short and long axis. And I'll say that more than one time here. But that way we can see what the injectate is actually doing. And, and sometimes I will, in the process of the procedure, will move to a different axis to see that. Okay, so that was a little introduction to what I'm going to talk about. We're going to review some important principles of just um, injection, talk about the anatomy, and, and do a few examples of procedures. So these principles apply to anything with doing the peripheral nerves, whether it's diagnostic or therapeutic. So you want to correctly identify that what you're looking at is nerve. Obviously, that's very critical. Use good technique. You should always know the surrounding anatomy and what influence the anatomy may have on the nerve. Use consistent measurement techniques. So you want to know exactly how far where your needle needs to go, what, how close it is to other objects and other things, structures that we want to either avoid or have an influence on. We always want to look at it in more than one axis so we see the entire picture. And we want to follow the course of the nerve. Sometimes the injuries are more than one place and more than one location. So we don't always want to get a, a single small window. And that's the advantage of ultrasound over other types of imaging is we can really see the in, entire nerve and its course. Okay. So just some guided, some basics for all the injections we're going to talk about in this course. We always want to pre-plan, pre-scan, make sure we've scanned everything that we know we're planning to do. Always consider the depth of our injection so we have enough needle to get there. I like to use an oblique standoff for most of my injections. I'll talk about that, uh, the difference between in-plane and outer plane We'll briefly talk about some of these. Most of you are already very experienced in these issues, but we have to be attention to artifact and avoid too many moving parts. So if we have a ultrasound, it's very helpful for difficult to reach injections. And um, I, I don't think I need to convince this group how valuable ultrasound is for um, doing these types of injections. So these are a number of target tissues for various types of injections. Okay. And we, we pick our transducer based on which type of tissue we're after. For most of the time for peripheral nerves, we want to have at least, you know, roughly the highest frequency that we can um, that will penetrate to our level. However, I will say sometimes we need lower frequencies if we need to see the soft tissue structures around the nerve. And sometimes it's, it's good to look at more than one frequency so we have that understanding. So pre-scan so we have enough depth. I mentioned that, okay. And our needle length is, is selected by depth. So we, you know, if you remember Pythagorean's theorem, it's going to be the uh, square root of uh, combining um, each of these directions, okay? So this is at a depth of 2.5 centimeters. We're going to need a needle that that's long, long enough to actually reach our target. And sterile procedures, uh, I'm not going to get into that too much um, for our time limitation, but there's different ways to approach it with a complete sleeve or um, a, a sterile field. And we tend to save that for um, more injections where it's a little more critical. Most peripheral nerves are very superficial, so we may not need an entire um, draping and of, of everything, but we also want to have enough of sterility that we can move our transducer around effectively, okay? And there's a, another way to do it where it's out of the field and, and using betadine and sterilized transducer. This is not as completely sterile, and the problem you could run into with this technique is you're not able to have as much leeway to move your transducer around. Okay, and we all know superficial versus deep. If you're more superficial, you're going to see the needle with greater conspicuity. So sometimes approaching it at um, a little greater distance may help us have a more effective procedure. When we have to go a little deeper to get into it, it's a little bit harder to see. As a steep angle. Hard to see, same thing with a more 
um, narrow angle is easier to see. This is the oblique standoff that I talked about. So we use sterile gel. This gives us a number of different advantages over these superficial injections. So one thing is that we can see the needle tip before it actually enters the skin, which gives us an advantage. The other thing is, it, look at the angle it puts our transducer then, so we don't put any, any anterior um, pressure on the needle, and that allows us to move the needle tip in there with basically 90 degrees to our transducer, so that improves the conspicuity of our needle approach. And instead of having this, the front of the transducer flat where we have a greater angle. Okay, so we want this kind of position. We don't want this position. Okay, and the other thing is it actually takes pressure off the tissue when we do this and use that oblique standoff. So I, I really encourage all my resident physicians to do that. We can use gel standoffs also. Um, now in plane, okay, we, we know the difference between in plane and out of plane injections and in plane means we can see the entire needle and this is our, since our peripheral nerve injections are virtually always a very vulnerable target i would encourage everyone to do in plane injections for peripheral nerve and that way you can have um, a good visualization of the tip and the entire shaft and sometimes we can get into trouble if we're not directly down the transducer we may think we're seeing the tip when we're seeing an oblique image of the needle if we don't see the entire shaft and we may think that the area where the needle crosses is uh, the tip. And I think sometimes in our anesthesia realm that we can get into trouble when we're doing large volumes. Out of plane, um, this is a nice way to get small joints and things of that nature where we see the tip emerge. The, the difficulty is that is we don't see the needle tip as it approaches. And that's a little bit more challenging when you have a vulnerable target. So the, the danger of out of plane is this looks like this, looks like this, and they all look the same on, on our ultrasound screen. So we have to really see the needle tip when it approaches. That's an in-plane approach to our transducer and allows us to see in-plane needles. And there's some more in-plane approaches. And this is a step-down technique for out of plane. So we, we back away when we, if we're not, um, if we're too superficial, we can back away and get to a deeper position and do that. But again, we don't really like that approach for peripheral nerves. Sometimes it helps to anesthetize the needle track in advance and allows you um, more ability to move your needle around, especially if you're doing a deeper nerve. Doing heel to toe rock adds conspicuity too. And to get, we wanna get our transducer as close to 90 degrees to our needle as we can. Okay, and that's the effect of heel to toe rock. And, Toggling is just moving back and forth when we're short access to that. By needle artifact, we know that the tip of the needle is actually at the superficial portion here. And this is just reverberation artifact from the needle. And that's when we're doing very small nerves, it's important to understand that. We can get echogenic needles also. And what those have is serrated um, shafts and that gives a big reflection. So. These are more expensive, but sometimes when we really need to visualize needles, we can use those. Some people like to use also blunted tip needles too, and where they can go right up against the nerve without causing injury. And um, that is also an option, okay? So finding the right needle and using your harmonics are very helpful to having success with these procedures. Okay, so one caveat, if you can't see the needle, it, tip, you shouldn't spend all your time staring at the screen. You want to remember to look down at the patient because that's where your patient is making sure things are lined up. And one of the single biggest mistakes the beginners make is they spend too much time staring at their screen because we have to be in the path of the transducer to be able to see the needle effectively. Okay. Now I say this correctly, identify nerve tissue. Okay. We, we know nerves have a hypoechoic signal relative to tendons most of the time, and they have a fascicular pattern that distinguishes them. We can use Doppler also to see the neighboring vessels, and sometimes that allows us to see the nerves more easily. And then also, we can also use Doppler to enhance visualization of the injectate flow. And so using Doppler sometimes to see where the injectate's actually going, we'll see that a little bit better if it's less conspicuous. And we also should pre-scan for anatomic variation. Here's an example of a very large persistent median artery uh, 
next to the median nerve in the carpal tunnel space that is creating a lot of the vascularity for the hand. So that does a couple of things. You certainly don't want to injure it. And you also want to be aware of that because it can change the normal position where the nerve is. So identifying the artery in advance with a pre-scan um, makes gives you an idea that you'll put your needle in the right approach. Okay. So in general, these are helpful for delivering injectate close to the nerve, allows us to visualize it in real time. We can avoid the vascular structures and can be used with different types of therapeutic injections and blocks and the hydrodissections. So it's we have to really accurately identify what's nerve tissue, should always pre-scan. And as I showed, we should have a straight line between the patient injection site and ultrasound screen. So um, you can look straight down the barrel of your transducer, so you're seeing that very well. It's also helpful to do a checklist for all the equipment in advance so you, you aren't surprised when you're doing the procedure. So for nerve safety, we wanna make sure that our transducer <laughs> This is moving on its own. Transducer must be placed perpendicular nerve as much as possible for accuracy. We want to identify the outer epineurium of the nerve so we can know actually how close we can get our needle because we want to avoid interneural injections in general. Should optimize your focal zone, optimize your grayscale mapping to improve the conspicuity of that nerve and set your depth so the target makes up the majority of the screen. You want to see the approach of the needle but you want to make sure that um, you're not using just a little portion of the entire screen for the nerve. And generally, the highest frequency with effective penetration, as long as we've pre-scanned the area enough, even with some lower um, frequencies, so we know what's below it and what's around it. And we should be very cautious about interneural injections because they can injure the fascicles and damage the nerve. So, and I think this is a sort of a repeat of what I've already said. But it's helpful to know the course and function of every nerve that you're doing injection with. You should do your pre-scan. Use a high frequency linear transducer. In most injections, you're gonna to wanna to do a short axis view of the nerve and an in-plane view of the needle. But with larger volumes, it's also helpful to be able to turn the transducer 90 degrees and see what's happening with a large injectate and long axis, because sometimes you can be surprised where it's going. So you wanna create a halo around the nerve that's gonna increase the conspicuity. So a little bit of injectate before you start using a large amount. And then the patient should be positioned between the ultrasound screen and, and um, you, so you see visualization of both the needle and the target site around the ultrasound, okay? And these are some things to consider, foot pedals if you need them. So this is the wrong way to do it. I already showed that picture. She's too far from the screen, not even paying attention to the patient. This is the right way to do it. We're set up, eyes can go here, eyes can go here. Everybody's comfortable and she can get a better look straight down the barrel of the transducer. Okay. So there's also beam steering available. Is when you use beam steering, it's changing the orientation of the incident sound waves. And that's helpful for deeper injections and it allows you to see the needle with a little better conspicuity. Okay, and there's an example of some beam steering here, what that does for this sort of deep injection. Let's just see it a little bit better. Okay, and you should be careful with virtual convex. I love to use those for diagnostic purposes, but sometimes that eliminates our um, cross beam and takes away some detail for hard injection. So we wanna be a little bit careful with that. Deactivates the cross beam technology, okay. And these are all things I have mentioned. And I won't repeat it all, but local anesthetics, sometimes we want to keep in relatively low volumes, but larger volumes are used for hydrodissections. And this is a couple examples of some sterile technique. This is the idea of just being completely out of the field. And uh, the problem is then if you're having trouble with the injection though, if you use this technique, you, you can't really, um, come in and try to save the day by moving it around. So I'm gonna give a few examples in the, I believe 10 minutes I have left here. So there's a, we can, we frequently do suprascapular nerves, oftentimes for radio frequency ablations in um, recalcitrant um, shoulder problems, but they can be used um, even for diagnostic or um, therapeutic for temporary blocks. Sometimes it's actually a nice, treatment for adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder. 
and draining cysts. So this is a simple approach and we have to use usually a spinal needle. It's usually about four centimeters deep in most people. And we can inject the, the uh, suprascapular nerve and the suprascapular notches below the um, ligament here in the artery and vein or just above it. So we wanna actually feel the pinch through the notch. Um, this is a nice way also to get through to a ganglion cyst that might be damaging the suprascapular nerve. So using this approach can be used to drain a posterior labral cyst. And when we do ganglions, it's not, not an injection for a nerve, but it can be used to sometimes remove a structure around a nerve. In this is the case, we're draining one from the deep fibular nerve. So I like to fenestrate those repeatedly with needles and make sure we then aspirate as much as we can out of it. And then I actually inject steroid and, and some anesthetic around the ganglion too. And if they're fenestrated ad adequately, sometimes they, sometimes they don't come back, but sometimes they do. Okay, now this is an example of the deep radial nerve at the supinator where we sometimes inject. And this is one that's, that's markedly enlarged. I, I show this because it's a different approach. It's, it's similar to any other injection, but this is one where it's in a, in a tunnel syndrome that's very tight. You're not gonna be able to get a really nice halo around that. It's not a reasonable goal most of the time. What you can do though is get within the fascial plane on both sides and, and create the halo uh, effect and actually open up space. So there your injection is not really directly at the nerve, but it may be within the fascial plane of the two heads of the supinator, for example. So it's a slightly different approach to come in that way to do that. And carpal tunnel injections are very common. Just like the same principles that I use for other nerves, I use for carpal tunnel in that I like an in-plane approach to the needle and a short axis view of the nerve. So this is the way I like to do it. Obviously, this is just a simulation. That's why there's no um, steril sterilization. And we can take the needle on both sides of it. Now I show this because you know, sometimes we don't, in, in the same window, we may not see the other structures as well as we see the nerve. It just depends on the anisotropic artifact and, and that angle that you want. So ideally you wanna see the nerve in the best detail. You wanna have scanned the rest of the anatomy, but some of my pictures look like this because it's, it's actually where the nerve is more conspicuous than the surrounding tendons. And here's an example we can see all pretty well. Okay, so what we're doing is we inject deep to it we try to get some opening, open up space, and then we'll kind of do it on both sides. For a carpal tunnel, I'm not as concerned about a hydrodissection unless it's a post-operative one, because you'll find if you do a post-scan, most of the injectate just moves right out of the space, but you're trying to get um, at least steroid, or if you're using dextrose primarily or around the nerve well, so it um, at least has a therapeutic effect. Here's an example of actually separating the nerve from scar. So we're cautiously putting a little bit of injectate there. You notice I rock the transducer to see the nerve, add a little bit of injectate on, um, on the top, and then try to actually tease out some of this scar away from the nerve once we've added a little bit of space. Okay, and there's a number of injections here. I'm gonna skip some of these here for time. I, I throw this out, what's wrong with this needle approach? Well. Remember I mentioned that we should always scan the structures, even, even though we have our um, image where we can see the nerve pretty well. The wrong thing here is we actually have a um, bifid median nerve because of an early bifurcation of the common palmar branch of the third web space. If you haven't recognized that, you could go right through the nerve fascicles with your injection. So you wanna make sure that you've uh, done that. Okay, and I think this last one shows the right approach. And I don't see my needle. So I guess I just showed that afterwards. So cubital tunnel injections are not really a thing I do very much of because most of them don't do very well. I know some people like to do these. There's not a lot of great indications. The studies don't really support that they do very well with typical injections where we do get involved sometimes is if they're post-operative and have a lot of scarring. And there's the basic anatomy where it goes into the arcuate ligament and potentially can get um, in trouble. And the idea there is to get a hypochoic halo around the nerve and maybe open up some space. Um, but again, I don't do a lot of those. The lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh is a frequent one that's sometimes very effective. We try to, um, we see this both for post-surgical hip patients that have scars in that region. And then the, the ones that are just related to entrapment at the ilioinguinal ligament. 
And this is a nice one. Again, in plane, we can find that nerve very effectively by looking between the sartorius and the tensor fascia lata, and it sits in that plane. And we can do a medial lateral or lateral to medial approach. I like lateral to medial to, because it avoids a lot of the medial structures and generally easier to do. Again, we want to create a halo around the nerve. And there's an example of creating that halo around that nerve and there's the iliacal ligament. So these can be very effective. Another example, we start with a little bit of injectate and go slow. And then once we move it, we can start increasing more injectate after that. And that's, that's my pre-scan actually. I think these got out of order somehow. There we go. So a small amount of injectate, and then you see it start to increase a little bit. And that way we do, we're careful we don't have to actually touch the nerve. We can move the tissue out away from the nerve by taking our time and doing it slowly. Um, can be very effective. I don't do a lot of these either. It's similar to the ulnar nerve. I think many of the times this is not a typical entrapment, but there are some situations where it's helpful to do. And this is a general approach from lateral to medial. And most of the time, if I'm going to do an injection, it's going to be near the fibular tunnel at the entrance. And we have to make sure we've identified all of the neurostructures there because a lot of them separate into the superficial deep branch. And we have to be careful about the lateral sural cutaneous, which is also neighboring that area. And this is a nice place to identify it within the confines of the fibularis longus. Okay, N tibial nerve at the tarsal tunnel. If it depends on what we're doing and why we're doing it, but if we're doing a steroid injection or a hydro dissection here, we want to make sure we aren't moving our needle straight into the vascular structures, but we want to be close enough to the nerve and, and doing this um, cautiously, usually from approach from the posterior side, it can be very effective and opening up a little bit of um, injectate first. We also so if we're doing blocks, we have to make sure we can identify the medial calcaneal branch. Otherwise, they're not going to be um, anesthetized at the heel, where it's often uh, very critical. There's a little small nerve. We can use the greater saphenous vein to identify the saphenous nerve, put injectate around that area, and we go past it and then identify the nerve with greater conspicuity once we've put our fluid in, and that's the post-injection for superficial fibular. There's also ganglion cysts and other things that can affect around the foot and ankle. And this is a number of um, things for a sural neuroma where you can identify a focal neuroma. This is a case where it's really hard to get this off the scar tissue for a post-surgical tissue. So a lot of times I will do the initial injection around the scar and make sure I'm opening up space around the nerve before we do too much and then just getting get closer as we go and then eventually open up space between the scar and the nerve. But sometimes it's helpful to work on the scar first. Okay, and that's, and I always do, I just do a slide in, I like to do post procedure scanning as well and kind of see what happens to it, how mo mobile the nerve is, and things after you've done the scan. And I, I know Dr. Alter just talked quite a bit about hemodenervation. So I, I don't really want to talk too much about that, but I thought I would mention that sometimes we're doing things to help nerves that aren't directly to inject the nerve. So we can, um, this is a nice study by Toriani et al. Um, doing the pretty good symptom improvement for thoracic outlet for various muscles that they've done, including this anterior scalene, pectoralis minor, and one subclavius. Here's another article where they started working on subclavius. And we've been doing a lot of these and having great success. Um, Catherine talked about identifying different things in the brachial plexus. One example is, is there a cervical rib or a really prominent posterior tubercle? We can identify anatomic landmarks that might contribute to, that, to neurogenic compression. We can look at the subclavius here. This is a long axis view in the infraclavicular portion. We see the clavicle. We can see the impact of the pectoralis minor. As I scan, use my transducer back and forth, I'll see the laterally, I'll see the lateral cord, medial, I'll see the medial cord and the posterior cord deep to the axillary artery. This is the second rib, pectoralis major. major. So this is, I'm not here to talk about thoracic outlet, but just give you some ideas that we can use some of this information then to try to help maybe a, a nerve that's dynamically trapped 
and maybe not statically. So here's an example. So we see this was, I did this one and the residents were all um, excited because this is the pectoralis major, this is the pectoralis minor, and we determined this is somebody that had retro pectoral thoracic outlet entrapment. And we advance our needle in there and we can see the injectate. And this was a simultaneously EMG and ultrasound. I don't have sound with it, but we found that this was even in a resting position, just like a cervical dystonia, the pectoralis minor was compressing the neurovascular structures underlying and was completely active on EMG, whereas the pec major was, was not. So we can actually combine this. We can use ultrasound for EMG guided procedures as well. Okay, and you can see the injectate flow directly into the muscle with, so we, we know absolutely that we hit that tiny muscle that was having an impact. So that's a work in progress, but it can also compare side to sides, things of that nature. So um, I, last slide here is just to make sure you're documenting what you do, why you did it, indication, you got informed consent, where you did it, how you did it, and post-op instructions is also helpful. So in conclusion, learning these basic scanning techniques will really help you in performing even advanced injections. We always start with the basics. And this can be a very, very effective tool for um, a lot of peripheral nerve issues, okay? Just a couple of references. And that is my conclusion. So I'm sorry I didn't leave us very much time for our break. So we can, I think uh, Dr. Jim scheduled a three minute break here before uh, Dr. Cantaro comes on. But this is beautiful Columbus, Ohio. So anybody that wants to come visit, I'll take you paddleboarding. So thank you. Thank <laughs> you.